Hello scholars, my name is Dr. Karis Dillon and the goal of this channel is to make academic subjects easier to understand. In the last video, we looked at the economic prosperity after World War II. In this video, we're going to look at the 1960s, so let's jump right into those 60s. The election of 1960 featured Democratic candidate John F. Kennedy against Republican nominee Richard Nixon. The previous president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was moderate and fiscally conservative. The Kennedy platform would be quite different. JFK, which was short for John F. Kennedy, wanted to see significant reforms in education, civil rights, and health care. Kennedy used the successes of Russia launching the satellite Sputnik into space as the main example of how the U.S. had fallen behind as world competitors. His platform would be known as the New Frontier. When the nation watched its first official televised debate featuring Republican candidate Richard Nixon versus Democratic candidate JFK, the difference was stunning. Kennedy looked well-rested, handsome, and knew his information. Nixon looked a little bit sick, a bit pasty, and nervous. When the results of the 1960 election came in, Kennedy had won 303 electoral votes to Nixon's 219. The nation was quite excited with Kennedy won because he represented useful ideas, ambition, and that things would soon change in our country. President Kennedy wanted a definitive win in the Cold War against Russia as well. His plan was to develop an extremely hard stance on the Berlin crisis Cuba, including Fidel Castro, and the developing communist tensions in Vietnam. Kennedy went right to work building up the military and its nuclear weapons arsenal. There was a $6 billion increase in military spending in 1961. The president also liked the idea of counterinsurgency. Being able to call on a variety of military specialties came to be known as having a flexible response. The first test against communism took place in Germany. Since Nikita Khrushchev had come to power in the Soviet Union, he threatened the U.S. with seizing the western portion of Germany. Even though Kennedy was able to sit down with Khrushchev in an attempt to find a compromise, neither could come to any agreement. President Kennedy finally made a move and called 150,000 National Guardsmen into duty as a show of force against Khrushchev. Khrushchev finally buckled and on August 13 started sealing off East Berlin from the West. Khrushchev moved Russian tanks toward the East-West border and especially all around the checkpoint Charlies where individuals had been once allowed to move from East to West. The tension on the border remained for quite some time but eventually diminished as time continued. The East would now be distinctly separated from the West. Not only was Kennedy concerned about Western and Eastern Europe, but he wanted to make sure Africa, Latin America, and Asia didn't fall to communism. The president created the Peace Corps and produced financial aid to countries who are at risk of falling to communism. JFK kept his eye on Vietnam because Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader of China, was providing assistance and economic aid to the Viet Cong in southern Vietnam. Kennedy sent advisors to find out what was really happening in the nation. His advisors returned stating the situation was dire and a need for 8,000 American troops was imperative. Kennedy decided against this but did send economic aid to Diem. The economic aid helped to supply the peasants with the ability to risk the Viet Cong. Deem's popularity withered and eventually Kennedy sent American forces, which by 1962 were about 8,000 uniformed soldiers. A coup eventually took out Diem and Kennedy questioned whether or not to pull the American soldiers back out of Vietnam. If he pulled out the American troops, Vietnam might fall to communism as China had in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The domino theory stated at the time was that if one country fell to communism, others would drop right alongside them. While Kennedy was attempting to deal with the issue of Vietnam, he was also involved with problems concerning Fidel Castro. When Fidel Castro came to power in Cuba, he aligned himself with the USSR. Before Kennedy had taken office, President Eisenhower had asked the CIA to train a group of Cuban exiles in Guatemala 
to take down Castro and his government. In order for this to be successful, the civilian people inside Cuba would need to take part in the takedown. On April 17, 1961, over 1,000 Cuban exiles moved toward the southern shore of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. The exiles were not ready for the extremely well-trained forces of Castro, and almost 500 exiles had to surrender within two days of fighting. Kennedy was strong enough to admit he was at fault for the Bay of Pigs and spoke to the American people, saying that he regretted only not winning the assault. At the end of his speech, he warned Russia that the U.S. would stop any communist expansion in the Western Hemisphere. Kennedy refused to aid Cuba or provide any support to any nation that was involved in communism. When Soviets began building missile sites where medium range and intermediate range, which were 1,000 to 2,000 mile missiles, were aimed toward the U.S. in the fall of 1962, America knew they had a tremendous problem. It was on October 14, 1962, that an American U-2 plane finally discovered these missile sites were very near being completed. Kennedy immediately gathered a group of advisors, brainstormed and simulated different scenarios. Eventually, a two-step plan emerged. First, the U.S. would quarantine Cuba and no longer allow new missiles. The second part would put into action a demand that Cuba would dismantle his weapons. Otherwise, Russia and Cuba would be met with nuclear weapons by the United States. On the 22nd of October, President Kennedy faced the nation and explained what the plan was for Cuba. He told the American people about the missiles being aimed at America and how nuclear war with Russia would lead to disaster. The American Navy surrounded the island of Cuba and planned to intercept 16 Soviet ships, pushing for their retreat. When the Soviet ships finally arrived and came very close to the naval blockade, they ended up shifting direction and started moving elsewhere. Khrushchev eventually sent a letter stating that if they themselves took the missiles out of Cuba, the U.S. would never be allowed to invade Castro's country. Once the Cuban Missile Crisis was done, Kennedy's popularity increased tremendously. Because the Cuban Missile Crisis had become so tense between the U.S. and Russia, the two nations decided to install a hotline to speed direct communications between Washington and Moscow within an emergency. One of the most controversial features about President JFK was that he chose his own brother, Robert Kennedy, to be his attorney general. Robert Kennedy didn't really have the experience for this position, but John respected his brother's loyalty to him and his ability to give him shrewd political advice. JFK's greatest asset was his own personality. He was attractive, he had a calm mood, and he was very intelligent and thought very quickly on his feet. Kennedy also had a great sense of style. His wife, Jacqueline, invited artists and musicians to the White House for various functions. Some outsiders called his presidency Camelot. When it came to the civil rights, President Kennedy allowed his brother to continue the advances of the Eisenhower administration in helping achieve equal rights votes for Southern Blacks. The Justice Department worked with the Civil Rights Movement along with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, in the Deep South. Within two years, the number of persons now set to vote was five times what it had been in the past. President Kennedy also made sure to appoint a number of blacks to high government positions. Robert Weaver became chief of the Federal Housing Agency, and Thurgood Marshall was named to the U.S. Circuit Court. In the middle of 1961, CORE sponsored a freedom ride in which people with all different skin colors tested a Supreme Court decision outlawing segregation on buses and trains in 1960. When the freedom riders got to Birmingham, Alabama, they were attacked by an angry white mob. The Attorney General sent hundreds of federal marshals to protect the freedom riders. Another civil rights issue that emerged during this time was with James Meredith. He was a black man who wanted to attend the University of Mississippi in 1962, which was an all-white school. Robert Kennedy attempted to talk with the state governor, Ross Barnett, but he was a racist and Robert Kennedy knew the discussions would be futile. 
A white mob then attacked federal marshals who'd been sent to protect Meredith. Two individuals died and over 300 were injured. Fortunately, Meredith ended up making it through school and graduated from the University of Mississippi. Problems didn't stop there. President Kennedy had to send the Deputy Attorney General to the University of Alabama in 1963 when Governor George C. Wallace attempted to stop two African-American students from attending the state university. Federal authorities finally were able to get the governor to stand down, but not until the tensions became extremely serious. It was also in 1963 when Martin Luther King Jr. began a massive protest in Birmingham, Alabama, which was an extremely segregated city. Protesters demanded employment for blacks and the integration of public facilities. Protesters were arrested, including Martin Luther King Jr., the police commissioner at the time, Eugene Bull Connor, was determined to make an example of the protesters in the civil rights movement. The protesters pushed back, and on May 3rd, 6,000 children marched in the same city only to be met with police dogs, power hoses, and clubs. The scene was caught on television, and the American people were horrified. The Kennedy administration immediately got involved. The laws changed quickly, but civil rights leaders knew that they needed to continue these protests. On August 28, 1963, 200,000 protesters and marchers came for a daytime rally at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington and prayed, listened to speeches, and sang religious songs in favor of racial equality. By the end of the rally, Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. The speech was momentous and unforgettable and has been and studied into the present day. On November 22, 1963, the nation would come to a halt when John F. Kennedy was shot multiple times as he rode in a motorcade in downtown Dallas, Texas. The story at the time was that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin of JFK, but science has more than proven this was essentially impossible. Americans were not only shocked by President Kennedy's assassination, but had no idea what to think when Jack Ruby on live camera shot Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the Dallas Police Department. The nation was in complete shock and grabbed for any sense of balance or stability that they could find. Jacqueline Kennedy must have understood the enormous weight she had and carried herself as strong and confident on camera. She and her children put on extremely brave faces as she continued to grieve and break down when away from the public. The government made sure to create and finish the Warren Commission and its report to put the nation's people to at rest. The report stated that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson was quickly sworn in as the president on Air Force One as the plane took him to Washington. It was important for the American people to know that government would continue even without their beloved president. President Johnson called world leaders, assuring them that the U.S. would continue its stability and continue to have peace. Before the end of the week, President Johnson would meet with Congress and would ask for Kennedy's civil rights bills and tax bills to be passed. Johnson wanted to make sure that Kennedy's legacy would be established. President Johnson knew he was quite different from Kennedy. Johnson was good with Congress and he was quite intimidating when he entered a room. He was extremely tall and often caught the attention of people because of this. President Johnson didn't have Kennedy's charisma though. He wasn't that great on camera and looked like a clever old man that couldn't always be trusted. Johnson's ally on the floor was Hubert Humphrey. They made sure to get the 1964 Civil Rights Act signed by July 2nd, which made it illegal to have segregated public facilities. When the election of 1964 rolled around, Lyndon Johnson wanted to win the presidency on his own. President Johnson focused on poverty as his national cause. In 1964, 35 million Americans were living in poverty. Most of the poor did not have access to any formal health care, education, and their parents tended to be as poor as they were. 
As part of his platform, President Johnson declared war on poverty. Under new government agencies, Johnson created programs like Head Start and Job Corps for those that needed vocational training. Lyndon Johnson's plan for America would be called the Great Society. He ran against Republican candidate Barry Goldwater from Arizona, and even though Goldwater was handsome and a really good speaker, he put down the Tennessee Valley Authority and spoke negatively about Social Security. Johnson tended to stay in the middle of issues and because of this won the Elector College and the presidency. President Johnson's first year was very important to him and he was able to help establish Medicare, which assisted disabled and poverty-ridden individuals with health care. He was also able to secure funding for education, including public and parochial schools. In 1965, Congress passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which gave $1 billion to impoverished school systems. While President Johnson was busy working with Congress, Martin Luther King Jr. decided to begin protesting in Selma, Alabama. Sheriff James Clark and various white authorities were using whips and cattle prods against demonstrators. When television crews aired police beatings and whipping black protesters charging from Selma to Montgomery, President Johnson sent the Alabama National Guard to protect the people. In less than half a year, Congress was able to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This law stopped literacy tests from being used to stop blacks from voting. This law definitely made a difference. Within a year, over 150,000 blacks were able to be added to the voting list in Alabama. The registration of blacks also went up by 400% in Mississippi. As Johnson made significant strides in domestic issues, attacks against communism became part of a foreign policy. When the leader of South Vietnam, Diem, was overthrown, this left a political vacuum in Saigon where there were seven different governments that took over and lost power within a very short period of time. In the beginning of August of 1964, the North Vietnamese attacked the Maddox, an American destroyer, with torpedoes. The Maddox was able to escape from the area, and the American Navy sent in the C. Turner Joy along with another American destroyer. Two days later, these destroyers fired upon North Vietnamese gunboats near them. The American people were told the destroyers were fired upon again, but this was not true. President Johnson also ordered airstrikes on naval bases operated by the North Vietnamese. President Johnson then went to Congress and asked them to give him the authority to repel any armed attack against the U.S. Congress passed his resolution and the American people felt the force against North Vietnamese was necessary. By 1965, it was obvious the U.S. would have to get involved with ground troops. Advisors to Johnson felt airstrikes would send a message to Hanoi to stop its aggression and the morale of South Vietnam would improve. The goal of the airstrikes was to stop the supply line of the North Vietnamese and damage Hanoi so badly that their economy would be halted. In April, President Johnson finally sent American soldiers to South Vietnam to protect America's air bases. President Johnson finally agreed to a steady increase in the amount of American soldiers being sent to Vietnam. He pushed hard for diplomatic resolution in Hanoi. Johnson did increase the bombing that took place in North Vietnam and finally allowed American soldiers to conduct offensive operations in South Vietnam. Johnson approved 50,000 more American troops to be sent into South Vietnam with a commitment of 50,000 more in the future. President Johnson knew that the more he committed weapons and troops to Vietnam, the worse the situation was going to get. Much to President Johnson's dismay, the bombing of North Vietnam was basically ineffective. The supply lines were left basically undamaged, and when American bombers attempted to destroy the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the North Vietnamese used the jungle to hide their shipments and, and their movements. The North Vietnamese worked very quickly to rebuild roads and bridges right after they were destroyed. The airstrikes were almost not successful in the fact that everyone would jump to just rebuild what had been destroyed. The only thing the airstrikes seemed to destroy were Vietnamese civilians 
who would then turn against Americans and against American soldiers. President Johnson continued the flow of ground troops from 184,000 in 1965 to more than half a million in 1968. The Viet Cong knew how to move in and out of the countryside and use guerrilla tactics to target American soldiers. The Viet Cong were supported by the North Vietnamese people who helped ambush American soldiers. American firepower often devastated the countryside and continued civilian death, which meant the Vietnamese peasants often sided with the guerrilla warriors. One example of this was in Mai Lai. In early 1968, Lieutenant William Calley Jr. and an American group of soldiers killed more than 200 Vietnamese villagers. It was thought that the Viet Cong had taken refuge within the village and the military had been told that the people were Viet Cong sympathizers. The American soldiers were told to burn crops, buildings, homes, and any livestock. Calley's troops had arrived earlier than they were supposed to, and they rounded up the civilians and shot them at close range. Some of the U.S. soldiers committed sexual acts upon the Vietnamese women. In 1964, the University of California, Berkeley, had a group of students form the Free Speech Movement, and they started taking over administrative buildings on campus. The college was basically at a standstill for two months. Other students at various universities followed their cause, the youth often tried new drugs during this time, listened to new forms of rock and roll, and were thought to be crazy by many traditional older Americans. Many of the students involved in these protests showed their opposition for the Vietnam War. In 1965, students at the University of Michigan had their first teach-ins and spread to campuses all over America. As the fighting grew worse in Washington, the protesters grew larger and larger. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you going to kill today, became the chant of the protesters. In the beginning months of 1968, black students at Columbia University and the SDS joined forces and took over four to five buildings, stopping the college from its day-to-day -day activities. Finally, after eight days of growing problems, the NYC police were able to stabilize the situation, but protests broke out at different colleges. The protests didn't lead to the end of the war, but the young people were able to get their voices heard. Young people showed their displeasure for what was happening in the nation through their clothing, sexual conduct, music, and hairstyles. Over 400,000 young people went to a three-day festival of rock music at Woodstock at Bethel in New York, where they experimented with LSD and smoking marijuana. The Yippie movement, which was led by Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, pushed for social protest and against materialistic culture. In 1964, black teenagers in Rochester and Harlem began to riot. In the summer of 1965, blacks in the Watts area of Los Angeles rioted by looting stores and burning buildings. Those African Americans that believed in protecting their rights by using violence took over the leadership of the NSCC and refused to help any whites. Stokely Carmichael stated that blacks should seize power in those parts of the country where they outnumbered whites. He called for black power. Things got worse when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in April of 1968 before he was able to lead the people in a protest against poverty. Riots took place in 125 cities after the death of MLK, and the worst of it was in Washington, D.C. Black individuals were not the only population of Americans that demonstrated and protested during the 1960s. Women were still being pushed into occupations like teaching and nursing during this decade and weren't always accepted as doctors and lawyers. Betty Friedan, who wrote The Feminine Mystique in 1963 and called the home a comfortable concentration camp, helped to move female issues forward. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 made it illegal for employers to discriminate on the basis of gender. Friedman also helped to establish the National Organization for Women Now. In 1968, an American base at Haysan was attacked by the Viet Cong. 
General Westmoreland pushed for more reinforcements, building in thousands of American troops into the area. Later, the Viet Cong used the Lunar New Year to launch an offensive attack against various large cities in southern Vietnam. They started raiding various provincial capitals on January 30, 1968, and one of the worst was in Saigon. For four to five to six hours, American television cameras caught gunfire and explosives in the courtyard. These offensive acts by the Viet Cong were known as the Tet Offensive, and American troops, as well as South Vietnamese forces, were able to keep the enemy at bay. Before the Tet Offensive, President Johnson had been telling the American people that the Vietnam War was almost over. The television footage showed something different. President Johnson decided to limit the bombing of North Vietnam in an effort to open peace negotiations with Hanoi. He had also told the American people that he would not be seeking another term in the presidency, knowing that Vietnam had tanked his popularity. In 1966, Bobby Kennedy began running for president as a very harsh critic against the Vietnam War. When President Johnson dropped out of the race, Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey threw his hat into the ring. Bobby Kennedy was a surefire win as a Democratic candidate, but his candidacy ended when a Palestinian immigrant assassinated him in a Los Angeles hotel. Therefore, Hubert H. Humphrey gained the nomination. Richard Nixon ended up running for the Republican Party's nomination for president, and he chose Spiro Agnew as his running mate. Nixon was against the Vietnam War and told supporters he would bring American troops home. He stated he would bring the divided nation back together again. Richard Nixon ended up winning the Electoral College and the presidency. Nixon showed moderation and restraint at the beginning of his presidency even though he was a very isolated man that didn't take to criticism very well. Nixon created a staff that he could keep Congress away from him as well as the media. H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman were able to deal with the domestic issues within the nation. Nixon really loved foreign policy and it was his greatest passion. His national security advisor was Henry Kissinger. And this is where we're going to end the video for this one. In the next video, we're going to take a look at all of the complications that come up in Richard Nixon's presidency. I'm sure you know some of them. If you can think of any before it comes out, please uh, put those in the comments section. Other than that, um, keep working hard on getting good grades. Um, I'm very proud of all of you for putting so much effort into your work and I will definitely be back to share more videos. I hope you like them. Feel free to subscribe. If you do, if you don't, then don't subscribe. <laughs> and But I will be back and I will talk with you later. Bye-bye.